thank you. Thank you very, very much, really. Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you very much, um, Eva. Sorry, I'm like, as you can see. <laughs> I have certain forces, but not all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you, Eva, and uh, Manija, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to speak, especially in this new um, canonical lecture series. Thank you, Liam, also for organizing my trip. Uh, here to London. It's really an enormous pleasure to give a talk here at the Architecture Association, but also in London, one of the capitals of European empires. I'm especially thrilled to be speaking in this very uh, series since canonical histories, old and new, must be continuously questioned and challenged. I would like to start to, or to begin by reminding, reminding us that while I'm speaking here in this very privileged space that I am obviously part of, there are people fighting for their own rights and for the rights of future generations. This is in Algiers, where Algerians are claiming their fundamental rights since February 2019. Algerians call their peaceful weekly protests, and we should also call these uh, protests also in the same way, al-Hirak, which means movement, physical and political. In October alone, there were protests in Algeria, Bolivia, Cameroon, Chile, Ecuador, Guinea, Hong Kong, Iraq, Lebanon, France, Spain, and the UK. Some of these people remind us that colonization has different forms of existence. It exists through the physical invasion and occupation of lands and people. It exists through both military operations and civil measures. It exists through the material and psychological subjugation and exposition or exploitation of human and natural resources. It exists through man-made environmental transformation and ecological transformations. It exists through technological threats and digital strategies of businesses and surveillance. It exists through global mechanisms of accumulation by dispossession and surveillance. It exists through global mechanisms of accumulation by dispossession and profound socio-economic and gender inequities. It exists through the implicit or explicit alienation and maintenance of power, domination, and war. It exists through forced traditional, religious, and cultural erasures. It exists at the very heart of destructed, projected, and built environment. It exists through the construction, labor forces, and material extractions and industries. It exists through the uncritical imposition of a language or of a specific language, literature, and knowledge. The frame of reference of the vast majorities of architectural histories and theories is Central Europe and Northern America, which often exclude the dynamic histories of colonialism, extraction, imperialism, migration, slavery, and wars, in spite of the fact that architects, decision makers, and populations have always been involved in these activities. What is often called peripheries, global south, developing countries, non-Western world, and the other, exists in reference or in opposition to the so-called centers, global north, developed countries, western world, or the self. This set of measurements derives from and results in a world order that has colonial features. The assessment of the validity of architecture and its histories and theories is based on certain notions, paradigms, figures, forms, texts, buildings, and styles. This mechanism of evaluation regulates the understanding and interpretation of architecture, as well as the inclusion and exclusion of its histories and theories of architecture. It also promotes and privileges certain cultural and intellectual aspects over others. Consequently, these criteria play a crucial role in institutionalizing architectural histories and theories and practices. The process of historicizing built environment from around the world, 
are contingent to the sources that scholars draw upon and on the languages that they speak. To dismantle the colonial syndrome is to question the nature of the materials employed to construct architectural histories and theories, as well as the linguistic skills and cultural values of the interpreter of these documents. The interrogation of the interpreter, the why, how, and what is being interpreted, is essential to the examination of the construction of histories and theories of architecture, their meanings, implications, and impacts. The written and unwritten protocols of the practice of architectural history and theory shape the inscription, transcription, production, and consumption of these histories and theories. Moreover, certain chapters of these histories and theories may be seen or used as instruments encouraging and reinforcing an intellectual domination and supremacy. The point here is not to undermine the discipline, not to ignore the canonical texts and methodologies, but rather to underline possible conscious or unconscious colonial ramifications of writing the histories and theories of the development of the built environment and the dissemination of these scripts. For instance, in historicizing architectural production and knowledges in the aftermath of the Second World War and during the Cold War, the existence of European colonial discourses, architecture, and planning in the large and abundant overseas colonies, colonized territories, departments, and protectorates of the European empires has often been overlooked and isolated. The role that the colonies and colonized people played in reconstructing European cities and the consequences of the formal end of European empires have often been disregarded in spite of the immense eff effect and huge scale of these colonial ruptures and legacies. Some of the most transformative events of the 20th, 20th century occurred in Europe and in the African continent, where various pro-colonial activities, anti-colonial struggles, and war for independence were taking place. The maps of these populations, territories, and environments changed within only a few years. The social, special, and political economic consequences of which were colossal on both sides of the Mediterranean including the forced displacement and migration of population, the presence of foreign military bases in newly independent countries, the rapid urbanization of cities and their suburbs, the reorganization of agricultural production and natural resources extractions, the distribution of building construction markets, the establishment of new political solidarities and alliances. Similarly, Naming cert certain historical periods and thereby their corresponding built environment is dependent on a European frame of reference. This re reference is partial, inappropriate, and sometimes outright in erroneous. The pre-Columbian or the pre-Columbian era refers to the history of the Americas before the arrival of Italian navigator and colonist Christopher Columbus in the Americas, as if this history or this territory did not exist before a European man saw it for the first time. The appellation American Indian architecture refers to the built environment of the people that Columbus mistakenly named Indios, Indians, as he believed that he reached the shores of East Indies during his search for a Western passage to the Indies. European colonizers have also invented the appellations Negro village, village negra, village negri, negerdorf, negerdorfeli in Schweizerdeutsch, in order to name the settlements that were inhabited by brown and black population in colonized African territories. Here we have a picture of a Negro village in Algeria or a postcard. It was the Portuguese who introduced the term Negro, literally meaning black, in the 15th century to designate Bantu peoples that the Portuguese had encountered when they arrived in Southern Africa. Since then, the term has been used in various languages and form, and it epitomizes a myriad of violent histories of end racist connotations, which continues or continue to this day.
The re-examination of the cartographies of architectural histories and theories demands a renegotiation of methodological boundaries and bias, a reconsideration of theoretical assumptions and conventions, and the recognition of geographical absences and presences. To be effective and effective, this expansion cannot count on adding on what it already exists or what is already there, because this will mimic the binary opposition between North and South, between West and East, strengthening the domination of colonial narratives and maintaining its frame of reference. Rather, this re-examination should rethink the very episteme that architectural history has generated and circulated, that is, to theorize the very architectural histories that are tossed today around some parts of the world and that sometimes seem to be homogeneous and hegemonic. If this seems to be a huge effort or an impossible mission, then there is something problematic about architectural knowledge, education, pedagogy, and practice. These are some of the issues that I have been thinking about and questioning in the last years through my teaching at the ETH Zurich, Geneva, Princeton, and Cornell, but also as Eva mentioned through my published work and exhibition and talks and panels. I have been trying to really understand how to read our discipline along and against the grain, to paraphrase anthropologist Anne Laura Stoller. I question these issues in Architecture of Counter-Revolution, the French Army in Northern Algeria, which was published by the GTA Verlag in Zurich in 2017 and has just came out in French, in the French translation by the Edition V42 in Paris, translated by Marc Saint-Tupéry, which is very important as this is really about French colonial history. So these are my interlocutors as well. I also question these issues in the exhibition Discrete Violence, Architecture and the French War in Algeria that was displayed at the ETH Zurich in 2017. And in the last two years, it traveled to the new institute in Rotterdam, the archive cabinet in Berlin, the Graduate School of Architecture in Johannesburg, led by one of the speakers of this very series, Leslie Loco, La Colonie in Paris, Viper Gallery in Prague, Cornell University, and 12 Gates Gallery in Philadelphia. I also tried or addressed this question in a, this recently published volume, War Zones, that I edited, which is the second issue of the new journal, the GTA Papers, that the GTA Institute ETH Zurich launched to celebrate its 50th anniversary in 2017. But this work is triggered by a French law that was decreed on February 23rd, 2005. On that very day, the French Fifth Republic, under the presidency of Jacques Chirac, decreed a law on, I quote, the recognition of the nation and the national contribution of repatriated French. Article 4 mandated that teachers must teach students about, I quote, the positive role of French colonialism, particularly in North Africa, that is to say, French Department of Algeria, the French Departments of the Algerian Sahara, and the French Protectorates of Morocco and Tunisia. The second sentence of Article 4 read, school programs recognize in particular this, the positive role of the French presence overseas, notably in North Africa, and concede to history, I repeat, concede to history, <laughs> and to the sacrifices of the combatants the, of the French army in, in these territories, the eminent position to which they have the right." End of quote. With Article 4, the French authorities dictated the contents of history lessons, brainwashed pupils studying in French schools, obligated teacher to shroud in silence a number of infamous colonial massacres, compelled teacher and pupils alike to prize French colonialism and imperialism, rejected the violence of colonialism, undermined the work of historians and their ongoing debates, offended all those who have lived or still live under a colonial regime, overlooked the accountability and responsibility of the French colonial authorities and celebrated the crimes that the French civil and military authorities committed, including the crimes that I will mention later of the French paramilitary terrorist group known as the Organization of the Secret Army. In the wake of the swift avalanche of national and international reaction, protests and debates and condemnation, which were particularly centered on the Algerian Revolution or the Algerian War of Independence, the French authority removed with some difficulty 
the, the aforementioned sentence a year later. So it existed for one year. However, France's intention to eulogize colonialism existed then and still exists today. In contrast to this imposed amnesia of Article 4, Architecture of Counter-Revolution the French Army in Northern Algeria examines a fragment of what the French authorities sought to circumvent. It illuminates a handful of the myriad of non-positive, to paraphrase the French legislators, characters and effects of French colonialism, including the key role of the French army played upon the territory and people of Algeria. Algeria was one, or was France's longest colonial, let's say, uh, uh, territory, colonial presence in North Africa that began in 1830. Eh? So we are talking about 132 years of presence. So the term war was formally recognized 37 years after the ceasefire in 1962. Indeed, it was not until October 1999, also under the presidency of Jacques Chirac, that the French authorities approved the use of the of official appellation La Guerre d'Algérie, the Algerian War, at French schools and in official terminology. Before 1999, the Algerian war was called Les Événements d'Algérie, the events of Algeria, and Les Opérations de Maintien de l'Ordre, the, the enforcement of law and order. I will return to the use of language in a minute. So the book engages with the built environment that were designed and constructed during this very contested war, which bore various names, the Algerian Revolution for the Algerian people, the Algerian Question for the United Nations General Assembly, the events of Algeria, <coughs> as mentioned earlier, the Algeria or the Algerian War of Independence for the French government from 1999 to today, colonial warfare for military historians, the dirty war for a number of French left-wing intellectuals in the 60s, modern warfare, irregular warfare, subversive warfare, psychological war, and counter-revolution for some French army officers, total warfare for other French army officers, and counter-insurgency operations for the US Army Waged against the tumultuous background of or backdrop of the Cold War, this armed conflict began in November 1954 and ended in July 1962. It was not the first war in Algeria's colonial history, but it was certainly the one that ended <clears throat> 132 years of French colonization. It was not only a war between French officers and the Algerian Ar uh, National Liberation Army, but it was also a conflict between the French civil and military authorities among French army officers, between the French left and right, between the French communists and leftists, between the French Gaullists and right-wing parties, between the East and Western Bloc, and among Algerian elites. Among the undeclared motivations of the French war to keep Algeria under French colonial rule was the protection of France's economic interests in the Algerian Sahara, which consisted not only in exploiting natural resources, oil and gas, but also in conducting nuclear tests in the Algerian Sahara. The French colonial regime detonated its first atomic bomb, called Blue Jerboa, named after a tiny jumping desert rodent in the Algerian Sahara on February 3rd, 1960. Others continued even after Algeria independence in 1962 and continued until 1966, so four years after the independence of Algeria. Counter-revolution, that's what the title says, Architecture of Counter-Revolution. Counter-revolution is widely regarded as the predecessor of counter-insurgency operation and thereby of the global war on terror. Counter-insurgency or counter-revolution is defined as comprehensive civil and military efforts taken to simultaneously defeat and contain insurgency. And therefore, it is not a war between two or more armies in a defined battlefield, but rather a war that invades the spaces of civil lives and activities. The practices and theories of counterinsurgency were developed by French officers in Algeria who gained their practical experiences during the Second World War and during the First Indochina War. <clears throat> 
These officers secretly transferred these methods to North and South America, notably Argentina, Chile, and to the United States of America during the 1960s. However, since the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the United States and other Western powers have overtly expressed their interest in French military practices in Algeria, notably in the famous Battle of Algiers. <clears throat> and in the way with which the French army created, learned, integrated, and enforced counterinsurgency measures. To grasp the extent of counter-revolution, I would like to quote the definition of total warfare that French Colonel Lacheroy, head of the services of psychological action and intelligence in the French Ministry of National Defense, stated in July 1957 during the Battle of Algiers. Total because not only does it mobilize in this effort all the industrial, commercial, and agricultural powers of a country, but it also takes up in the war efforts all women and children and elderly men, all who think, all who live, all who breathe, with all their forces of love, all their forces of enthusiasm, all their forces of hate, and it throws them into war. This is the new reality. Total war, because it takes the souls as well as the bodies and it yields them to the obedience of war efforts. Architecture of counter-revolution dismantles the effects of these measures on the transformation of the Algerian territory and reveal the political, social, economic meanings of laws, maps, structures, infrastructure, shelters, and other buildings. The book is structured in 10 episodes, each one seeks to identify figures, protocol, and times involving a convergence of architecture and political military operations. The episodes are guided and framed by a number of protagonists and antagonists who represented the French institutions and government, both military and, and civil. Each chapter examines one aspect of French colonial counter-revolutionary architecture and suggests a reading of the psychology of French colonialism. What do I mean with the convergence of architecture and political military operations? I will give you two very brief examples, chapter four and nine, and then I will try to elaborate very quickly on chapter on three chapters, one of the most silenced parts of this period. So the first chapter, well, the chapter, the first example is chapter four on General Charles de Gaulle's colonial project. This chapter discusses the intersection of the return of Charles de Gaulle to power in May 1958, following the first general putsch in Algiers, with the policies proposed by Paul de Louvrier, who, appointed, who was appointed by de Gaulle as delegate general of the French government in Algeria. As, an, as a footnote, after his experience in Algeria, de Louvrier became the father of the new towns in France, especially in Paris. He became the general delegate of the district of Paris region from 1961 to 1969, and the leader of the Institute of Urban Planning of the Paris region. So we see here also this relationship between the colony and the so-called metropole. So this chapter investigates the premises on which General Charles de Gaulle launched the colossal socio-economic development plan called Le Plan de Constantine, named after the eastern Algerian city where he launched this plan. This plan included the construction of housing unit for one million people during the war. This chapter examines the typologies of housing programs that the French technocrat received and planned for Algeria and Algerians, as well as this program's association with post-Second World War housing programs that were built in France by the French Ministry of Reconstruction. It discusses the similarities, differences, and objectives of these mass housing policies and projects. Here we see a propaganda video. This episode also chronicles General Charles de Gaulle's attempt to partly divert the scope of the armed conflict and discusses de Louvrier's assignments to transform the Algerian population and territory. De Gaulle wrote in his communication to de Louvrier that, I quote, 
The will of the French government is that Algeria, through the troubles and despite the delays, reveals gradually its, in its deep reality, sorry, re reveals gradually itself in its deep reality thanks to the action conducted by France. To this end, you need to pacify and administer, but at the same time, transform. I will go, come back to the term pacify or pacification. Another example of this, of the convergence of architecture and political military operation can be found in chapter nine, titled Erecting Fortress Roche Noir. This episode highlights the events around 1961 and the last months of the Algerian Revolution, including the second French general putsch in Algiers and the creation of the French paramilitary terrorist group known as the Secret Army Organization. The OAS was composed of French civilians and military officers and was support, supported by French and European people who firmly disapproved of the policies of the Fifth Republic and its leader, General de Gaulle. The OAS carried out acts of lethal violence against civilians in order to prevent Algeria's independence and fiercely defended French colonial sovereignty over Algeria. This chapter illustrates how General de Gaulle attempted to protect the French government in Algeria, its French civil servants and their families from the bloody terrorism of the US by designing and building a new city called the Black Rock, Roche Noir. Roche Noir was located about 50 kilometers east of Algiers, near the Mediterranean Sea, the French Air Force Base at Raya, and the international airport as at Maison Blanche. This episode examines the unprecedented rapidity with which the French bureaucrat or bureaucratic machine was suddenly able to design and build a new town in less than eight months from February to September 1961. Designed by French Beaux-Arts architect Louis-Gabriel de Homme de Marien, winner of the first Grand Prix de Rome in 1951. Uh, He's very well known in France today for his co-design of the Tour de Montparnasse in Paris. Roche Noir was one of the most protected construction sites in colonized Algeria. After its partial completion, it became one of the most surveilled settlements in colonized Algeria. With an area covering 300 hectares, the fortified administrative city was expected to contain offices and 7,000 7, housing units for a population of 30 to 35,000 inhabitants. The majority of this ambitious pro project was realized. Swiss-born architect Jean-Jacques Delus, who was in Algiers at the time, of the de decision-making criticism, debates, and construction of Roche Noir provided his interpretation of this project. He wrote, by 1961, all credits were channeled to this false city. All operations were frozen to its advantage. De Marien, architect, architect Pridroam, was appointed. They chose a site in East Algiers, accessible from the, air, from the airport, but without contact with Algiers. Roche Noir lived day and night in the fever of a delirious construction site, which was effectively completed within the allotted deadlines. Then the city became that which it was planned to be, a ghost town abandoned in a grandiose landscape, but without poetry, without architecture, without history. However, one of the most suppressed episodes in the history of the French war in Algeria that I tried to voice in this book through three different chapters and that I will try to summarize, and it's also the theme, the topic of the exhibition Discrete Violence that I will also introduce very briefly. This taboo history is what the French Army had called les centres de regroupement, regrouping centers, or what I rather call regrouping camps, the camp de regroupement. A massive forced relocation of Algerian civilians, 
This is also a moment when architecture and political military operation converged. This massive forced resettlement was launched a few days after the outbreak of the Algerian Revolution on November 1st, 1954, when the French army designated a number of rural areas as forbidden zones. The forbidden zones consisted of free fire zones for both air and ground French military forces that needed to be cleared of any living being, including animals. The prohibited regions were frequently isolated places. They comprised not only immense woodlands and highlands, but also vast inhabited rural areas from which Algerian civilians were relocated in mass to ensure a security zone for the French army. Although these camps were intensively created since 1954, it was not until 1957, under the military command of General Raoul Salon, France's most decorated officer, that official military policy stamped secret, secret, confidential, and top secret began to regulate the creation of the forbidden zones and to normalize the forced resettlements of the civilian population. This was particularly the case with the construction and completion of the defensive, as you can see here, Perimeter, uh, uh, defensive perimeter known as the Maurice Line that sealed off Algeria's eastern and western borders with neighboring Tunisia, Libya, and Morocco, whose aim was to prevent human circulation and material exchanges. Historians, civilians, civilian and military have never agreed on the exact numbers of the involuntarily displaced population, the devastated villages, and the newly built settlements. One can only cite a few estimates. One estimate for 1960 evaluated 2,157,000 persons have been evacuated from their homes and arable land. Whereas another estimate for 1961 consisted that, considered that at least 2,350,000 people were concentrated into camps and that additional 1,175,000 persons were forced to leave their original homes due to constant and violent military operations. That is to say, to say 3,500,000 500, persons were forcibly displaced in Algeria. Here you can see that every dot represents a camp. Another figure for February 1962, just a few weeks before Algeria gained independence, reported that 3,740 camps, so it's massive, eh, were effectively built in Algeria and the French colonial year since the outbreak of the Algerian Revolution on November 1st, 1954. But who built these camps? Central to this French military policy were the so-called specialized administrative sessions, the SIS. These extraordinary army units were deployed in rural areas in order to complete both military and civil assignments. On the one hand, the military missions of the SAS officers entailed the gathering of intelligence, diff diffusion of propagandistic information, the ensuring of law and order, and the direct control of the civilian population. On the other hand, their civil functions were to provide social, economic, educational, sanitary, medical facilities, as well as to organize and build military control camps. By the end of 1961, there were more than 700 SAS in the great areas of Algeria. In an attempt to supervise the majority of the population, every SIS extended its various operations over a maximum of 10 to 15,000 persons, which was considered to correspond to the population of approximately two to three Algerian villages. The chief of the SAS was expected to have the ability or was directly trained to speak the local language of the geographic area in which he was appointed, either Arabic or Berber languages. In October 2005, so a few years ago, and 50 years after the establishment of the first SAS, the French Military Army Center for Force Employment Doctrine and the French Ministry of Defense released a thick study called The Specialized Administrative Sessions in Algeria, an Instrument for Stabilization, 
The military survey was based on a number of interviews with former SAS officers who served in Algeria. The survey intended to divulge French experiences in Algeria, and particularly to provide a guide for the so-called stabilization of local population claimed and enforced by French troops. I quote, in charge of similar assignments in Bosnia, Afghanistan, and soon in Kosovo. As asserted in these 2005 military guidelines, the SAS were the direct successors of the 19 century Arab bureaus in the French department of Algeria and of the, 19, sorry, of the 20th century indigenous affair in the French protectorates of Morocco, as well as of the famous military colonial officers, Bujot, Thomas Bujot, who was the Marshal of France <coughs> and former Governor General of Algeria, and Hubert Lyoté, French Army General and former resident general of, in Morocco. So here, the point is really to study the continuity and circulation of colonial protocols from the 19th century to the 20th century and among French colonies and protectorates. The 2005 manual, however, made no mention to the camps, nor did it refer to the peculiar roles played by SIS officers in the policy of mass resettlements of the civilian population. Instead, it dedicated less than a page to the so-called, or the so-labeled, village de regroupement, pretending to be part of the economic activities of the SIS within the socio-economic development plan launched by General de Gaulle in October 1958 that I mentioned earlier. Contrary to this assessment, French military archival document that I showed in the exhibition, this kid violent, give evidence to or of the fact that SIS officers were responsible not only for evacuating existing villages for military purposes, but also for supervising the construction of the camps. Furthermore, in April 1959, French newspaper, newspapers leaked the existence of the camps and provided an unprecedented media coverage. The scandal urged the French authorities to reconsider the policy of the forced mass resettlements of the Algerian population. As a result, the French colonial regime launched another plan another national plan called 1,000 Villages and created a military instruction known or institution known as the General Inspection of the Regrouping of the Population whose mandate was to inspect the regrouping of civilian population in which he argued or they argued that, I quote, the creation of the regroupment is the most effective means for subtracting the population from the influence of the rebel. I don't think that these images need further description, but we can clearly see the planning principles behind them. Whereas the key word for Algerian revolutionaries was dispersion, for the French counter-revolutionary it was concentration. The regrouping camps were part of the French colonial architecture of counter-revolution. So this book seeks to demonstrate that during this war, Algeria's territory served not only as a warfare theater, but also as a breeding ground for new buildings and infrastructure that had been designed to oversee, administer, transform, and assimilate Algerians to French colonial rule, as well as to protect French civil servants from the terrorism of the opponents of General de Gaulle. In contrast to architectural research that is conducted in peace zones, research conducted in war zones and zones of conflict predominantly implies inquiries into the politics and psychologies of such designed spaces, territories, mechanisms, and their architects in the sense of creators, but also designers. It is not surprising that the fragmented declassified military archives do not provide access to the maps or plans that may have served for this destruction or defense of a given area, nor do these orchestrated sources of 
offer any visual record that might represent the nature and persecutions of military special counterinsurgency operation. Instead, the majority of the surveys, photographs, and films were commissioned to produce meticulous propaganda. Images or propaganda images and were put in place to ease the escalating national and international criticism against the French civil and military policies in Algeria. Therefore, this research has also delved into the vast collection of French military aerial photographs that resulted from various recon reconnaissance missions during the war. The controversy of these audiovisual documents, so these propaganda images, concerned and inspired me. While I was writing the book to organize an exhibition and tell the story of the camps to a wider audience, the exhibition Discrete Violence, Architecture and the French Army in Algeria features how and why the French army forcibly displayed millions of Algerians in colonized Algeria during the Algerian Revolution. It juxtaposes the evacuation of the Algerian rural population, the building processes of the camps, and the living conditions in the camps. Over four years, I gathered a variety of sources, civil and military, public and private, films, photographs, and archival textual documents. Some of these sources come from the Service Cinématographique des Armées, the SCA, Cinematographic Services of the Army, a French military institution created in 1915 during the First World War in order to produce and orchestrate the circulation of audiovisual war information. During today, the SCA is called the ECPAD, Audiovisual Communication and Production Organization of Defense, and is still active in war zones where the French army is involved, such as in Mali. One of the aims of the exhibition is to attempt to depropagandize these records and create tensions and relations among different voices, stories, and fragments. Discrete violence unfolds the intrinsic relationship between architecture and military measures, colonial practices, and the planned production and distribution of visual and textual records. It is an exhibition that asks the visitor to engage, to study, to listen to the silence of the video propaganda. The sound was intentionally removed to read the military directives and orders that were secretly released during the French war to keep Algeria under colonial rule. I have highlighted in pink some of the most controversial aspects that contradict the images. To pay attention to the language and terminology used by the French army and by French journalists writing for left and right wing newspaper art newspapers, to look very closely to the photographs that document in the, make, the making of these propaganda audiovisual documents. Discrete violence challenges visitors and incites them to engage with the order or disorder of things. It does not show violence, but rather it portrays it. It does not reproduce propaganda, but it makes use of it against itself. It does not create effects, but it incites effects. Along with this first iteration of this exhibition, the, most of the photographs that you saw here are from the first iteration, so when it was um, presented at uh, the Geta exhibitions at the ETH Zurich. So along with this first iteration, I tried really to situate this emblematic case among many others around the world by conveying an international conference in architecture and wars, forms and Forms of construction and destruction in war zones in 2017 at the GTA Institute. It was a two-day conference that gathered not only architects, urbanists, historians, PhD students, a philosopher, but also a military officer who was dictating the behavior of humans, or who are dictating the behaviors of humans and built environment on the ground. Some presentations became articles and were included in this volume, War Zones, that they have edited and that came out a couple of months ago, published by the GTA Verlag. The approaches and backgrounds of the authors were really diverse. Here you can see 
for example, Jean-Louis Cohen, designing within and for war zones, or, Sylvie, or uh, Felicity Scott, haunted uh, by war. I will mention maybe three, let me just look at the time, maybe three very brief cases, because they are also very important in this conver larger conversation about the intersection of architecture planning, colonial policies or practices and military operation. For example, Sylvia berger Ziodin. she's a historian based in Bern, Switzerland, and she discussed here how since the early 1960, the Swiss authorities built 300 sorry, 360,000 private nuclear shelters, the majority of them in the basements of family homes, and invested to this day 12 billion US dollars in constructing high standardized nuclear shelters for the population. By 2006, the protection ratio reached 114%, meaning that Switzerland currently has more protective spaces than inhabitants. Another example, Aisha, Safras, and Aslan Rafiq, two architects based in Lahore, Pakistan, who analyzed in their essay, Barricade Urbanism, the case of contemporary fortification in Lahore, the urban transformation in the age of asymmetric warfare and contemporary conflict, and they analyze how it is amplified when considered in the light of its history as the imperial capital of various rulers. Here you can see one of their visualization. They really tried to map this, what they called um, barricade urbanism. Another example is the article by Asia Mandik, an art historian based in Sarajevo, who investigated how to survive in the besieged Sarajevo, city of Sarajevo, from 1992 to 1996 during the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and discusses the production and use of Sarajevo survival map and guide that was written during the first two years of the siege, when military office, uh, forces of Bosnian Serbs, assisted by the heavily armed Yugoslav People's Army and Serbian and Montenegrin um, uh, paramilitary troops, took control of the mountains and hills surrounded, surrounding Sarajevo. <coughs> Another author, Ismail Sheikh Hassan, a Palestinian urbanist based in Lebanon, analyzed the 2007 destruction and reconstruction on Nahr al barad a Palestinian refugee camps camp in Lebanon. He reflected on the roles, potential, and limits of what he called design activism in extraordinary conditions, such as camps, wars, and civil crises. Both Nahr al barad activists and Lib Lebanon, Lebanese state institution used architecture and urban design as a tool for envisioning and advocating a new reality in, their after in the aftermath of the war. I would like to conclude with the introduction to war zones in which I traced the links between colonial wars and counterinsurgency, between 19th century colonization and 20th century declared and undeclared war zones, between French and US and other Western schools of the so-called winning minds and hearts. In his chapter, African Grammar, published in his uh, 1957 book, Mythologies, printed during the Battle of Algiers, Roland Bart argued that the official terminology used by the French representatives of colonial African affairs is purely axiomatic, a mask designed to divert attention from the nature of the war and cover the real facts with the noise of language. So according to but this grammar, which is still in vogue today, is both ideologically burdened and politically loaded. He defined war as war. The goal is to deny the thing. For this, two means are available. Either to name it as little as possible, more 
frequent procedure, or else to give it the meaning of its contrary, more cunning procedure, which is at the basis for almost all the mystifications of bourgeois discourse. War is then used in the sense of peace and pacification in the sense of war. Thank you very much for your attention. It's a really powerful and important lecture. Um, I think there are just so many things that I could ask you about, but um, maybe to kickstart the kind of question portion of the evening. Um, throughout the lecture, it was really interesting how you talked about language and even the way you ended just now. Um, and I was just curious as to like what are the tools to of deco decolonizing or um, expanding and reject, undoing the kind of colonial forces that are like embedded in language, the terminology we use, the languages that we discuss or write about architecture in. Um, we, the AA is kind of launching this architecture and translation project, and so it really ties into that um, as well. And I was just curious because it came up so many times from the beginning mm -hmm. to the end of your lecture. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, language is highly important, of course. We use language, and it depends also which language. Now we are speaking in English, so <laughs> let's talk about English language. Um, yeah, so when you write, and this is what I try also to do at the very beginning of the lecture, is to, to situate really the, the major questions that I'm really concerned with. Um, one of them is really the language. So when you read, for example, primary sources, in this case, when you work on a colonial context with a military, let's say, situation, the language that is being used is a language that is um, uh, addressed to um, various, let's say, audiences. So when I read, um, uh, army um, or military directives, some of them are directed to officers, uh, uh, let's say junior officers, um, uh, uh, there is a whole hierarchy as well in, 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 in that um, institution. So in, for each audience, the language is very, very different. So when I started really this research, um, when I read the way that um, a general was speaking to his officers, and then how the generals among themselves were speaking, they were really talking about a revolution and counter-revolution, but never about war with the officers. It was just an insur insurrection. It's temporary, we are going to get rid of it, don't worry, just keep going. I mean, this is really about um, understanding how to unpack and how to um, um, uh, re recontextualize that language that you are also interpreting, because I am reporting, I am uh, writing about that, so how do I keep that uh, part and not change it. For me, this was very, very important as well. So it really depends on, on the context, but as uh, uh, Bart said, uh, we really have to make sure to not mimic this cosmetic writing and cosmetic language as well. So that's, for me, very important. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I have so much to say, and probably not in this Q and A section because it would take too long. It's okay. We uh, have because time. I feel like no, 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 no. It will take too long because I am um, no. I can guarantee you, it will take too long because uh, I did a year-long project, and I'm going to do it more for more years. I don't know how many more years. Probably infinite amount of years about the Malayan emergency, which is. You mentioned hearts and minds briefly, and that is the genesis of the kind of British paradigm of yes. counterinsurgency. Uh, I had so much <laughs> to say. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't know where to start, but. It was interesting because I had gone through the, British, the, the National Archives, like, and I'm going to do it more. I just don't have time right now um, to read these primary sources, and they were like constantly insisting that the people mm -hmm. who were forcefully resettled were doing this voluntary, no, it wasn't voluntary, uh, voluntarily, and that there's like t these terrorists were just bandits that were threatening these people. And then like my point of questioning within that was also hearing stories from my own family because I had families that were on both sides of the fence in regards to the, the Kampong Baru, which is the forced settlement, where, 
I had family members that were designated as terrorists, and I had family members that were interned in these camps. And that's how I managed to penetrate that military document. But I have still not yet found something where I can conveniently highlight and be like, oh yeah, can you question? But it's interesting, because like, I'm, I've seen that the French one is way more like sophisticated, like not sophisticated, but tidier and like neater than the British one, because like when you were showing this kind of urban plans, they were like way easier to understand and notice than the Malaysian ones, because the way that the Malaysian ones were planned was basically they forced these people to resettle. They just drew out the road saying, this is the main road, that's the road for the school, that's the road for the, the community center, blah, 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 and then like, uh, asked the villagers to construct their own buildings. And there was a specific typology of building that was constructed, but the urban plan as such is less visible and understandable on at least a superficial level like that. And it's interesting because I had been to many of these camps and not known the history because it was specifically erased by the government and it continues to be erased. In fact, the prime minister recently announced like on the 21st of August, I realized that was that's the day before my mom's birthday, um, <laughs> to an urban, a master plan to erase all these camps permanently because they're saying that this is like, shameful in the country or what, not shameful, actually they're not saying that shameful, they're saying that it's not modern, it's unhygienic, but actually there is a heritage they specifically want to erase. And I, I don't know, this, this, that, this, this, that, I, that's, like I said, there's too much to say. <laughs> I, I think I'm gonna write the same book, but like for the British paradigm, but I'm not very good at writing, so maybe I won't write it, I don't know. Please do it, please do it. I mean, that's really the idea. This is not, that's why the conference, that's why like the, the editing of that, that uh, the war zones as well. Um, I think it's really important to trace all these uh, parallels, uh, yeah. I think. But, but, but I'm, I'm wondering, because you were saying that this was, because oh, I, I, like the, the BRICS plan was um, hatched on 1950 by Harold Sprague, which was the, the guy who made it. But you're saying that the, uh, the, the kind of, Counterparts within Algeria, it's 1954, is that what you said? When they started, it yeah. was 54, but yeah. it started in a very chaotic way, and okay. then 50, 57, 57, like more normalized, which is very problematic, of course, mm -hmm. 59. Then it was like some yeah. of them, the, the permanent camps were transformed but into. But there was no communication between Britain and France copying each other. I have to say there is a, there is a book I can give you later. Um, yes, I yes. need a reading yes. list. Yeah, yeah, I need the, a reading list. That, that's that, also another thing I need to yeah, get. No, that, that makes this, this the two parallels really the, the Algerian, the French in Algeria, and then the British in yes. Yeah. Can, yeah. yeah, we'll talk later. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Samia, thank you so Hi. much. Um, for this, and I've seen your work in, in multiple forms, and I'm really intrigued um, on a kind of, let's say, a question that yeah, I'm kind of interested in personally. But say, the way you begin, right? You have the image of the, the current kind of Algerian revolution, and I wonder if you can just maybe speak um, a bit as someone who practices as an architectural historian, and how far do kind of particular, like, you know, you, you, you structure and you think through your mode of analysis through particular historical moments, right? And so how far can, for example, the most recent events begin to condition or be considered within the histories and the narratives that you are writing? I mean, on one level, obviously, in certain instances, I mean, in the case, for example, of Libya, that new archives were opened, right? And so there's a kind of very explicit understanding of how a particular historical narrative can begin to shift and how, a kind of, as through the practice of like a history or a historian. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if you can maybe reflect, I mean, maybe it's too early, but how do certain you know, events begin to condition a kind of your analysis as it operates in the kind of contemporary moment, right? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's very important, first of all, to remind us all that yes we are in a very privileged uh, space I mean uh, there are really people on the ground this is extremely important to always remember and I always acknowledge this so I am um, what, what why I started with that image uh, there was a moment very recently uh, when Algerians started to ask their independence we want independence this is the same term that they were also using during the Algerian revolution, the Algerian revolution against the French colonial regime. So this is a very, I think for me, as an Algerian, not as an historian, a very important, let's say, moment to understand the struggle of civilians, of people, of Shab, 
as it is called, so of really civilians and really understand, the, the, again, the use of, of language and the use of terms like independence. What does it mean when the Algerians are asking, we want our independence now? So this is something, it's like really I have to think about it. I'm, I, I'm not going to write about it, but it's really something that we have to keep in mind so that the struggles against uh, 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 imposed powers, against regimes of oppressions are continuing, are really part of our uh, uh, daily life and the daily life of millions of people around the world today. That's why this parallel. Any other questions? Oh. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, I was wondering if, um, when you mentioned the French kind of publishing this knowledge disguised as like other things, if you see any of these sort of like spatial typologies like now and yeah, like being yes. used. What do you think? Well, yes, <laughs> but like just like. <laughs> I was wondering if you could like point to any specific things, that, yeah. specific examples. I mean, again, I, I'm, I always like to be very specific and not generalize. I, I, I have problems with like saying, okay, this is, you know, everywhere. So what I want to really highlight is the fact that while this struggle was taking place, so especially during the Battle of Algiers in 1957, this exchange, this exportation of military knowledge was taking place at that time. So there was this conference, inter-American conference, so in Buenos Aires, where all these military guys met and discussed how to um, uh, prevent, how to obstruct, how to uh, detect and fight insurgencies or revolutions. So this is really something that um, it's quite, you know, important to know. After the independence and especially the last years of the independence of Algeria, some of these French officers went to the US. So one in particular, David Galula, he worked at Harvard and he brought his two books in English first, you know, not in French, not, so he is teaching, so he is uh, theorizing the practices and this is also when, you know, how the military uh, uh, operates, they first test, so, they first um, uh, practice and then theorize. So these theories were circulating at the time in the US. Um, and in this um, introduction, I really, you know, from colonial wars to counterinsurgency, I try to map that, that, that fil rouge, that red threat, to understand how these colonial practices in the 19th century circulated in the colonies, I, there is a moment as well when we have uh, Vichy, so fascist uh, uh, French officers who are, were working, so they brought their own knowledge from fascism in Algeria and then they went back to France after the independence. So these practices are also happening in the democracies, you know, republics and all that, so in France, for example, but also how they were exported to the world, to North and South America, and they were also used in Afghanistan, as I said before, in Kosovo, in Iraq, and again, other people should really uh, take one example and see how uh, these special measures can be read in Malaysia, in Kenya, and you know, with the mom, I mean, yeah, with, in Vietnam, I have a very long list, but. <laughs> <laughs> Malaysia, Kenya, Vietnam is all that one paradigm. Like but very specific. Yeah. Always extremely, yes, they have, yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. So, in that long list, or let's put it the other way around. So, how do you see the situation in the Sahel in which terrorism is a much more clear threat somehow? Um, and how do you see the presence of European countries in there, um, specifically France? So you know, it's really difficult to respond to this question. I would uh, invent. We know very, very little. You know, uh, and it's again, is ES, uh, CPAD, you know, the, 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 the institution that I mentioned before, they are the ones who are producing images. They are the ones who are uh, dictating or like 
deciding what we should know and we should not know. I mean, it's really very, I, I'm, I'm reading as much as I can, but these are all very orchestrated news. I, 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 I can't like publicly now say, yes, this is what I think. We can definitely discuss privately about it. Um, hello. So I have a very personal question. Sure. Um, I am Algerian on my mother's side, um, and when I like, devoured the book this summer, and I tried telling my mother about it, she responded very violently and was quite... She had a lot of difficulty, especially in the chapters about De Gaulle and going and kind of, I don't know, challenging the narrative that's kind of sold. So I was just wondering, I mean, it's quite basic as a question, but about the reception, especially from the Algerian community specifically, um, to this type of, I mean, like crazy information. But did, did, did she read, did she read the, the French version of the book? No, I mean, I was okay. recounting it to her. Yeah, so. no, I'm just asking because the, um, I was in Paris three weeks ago. Um, the book came out in, on the 8th of November, yeah, so two or three weeks ago. Um, and we presented it in two venues, and in December we are going also to present it in other venues. I was interviewed by a radio, um, France Culture, a radio, um, French radio, and I will be part of a conversation um, in the uh, Mediapart, it's a French, uh, yeah, independent. Uh, so the reaction we will see because it's just, it's, it's really just has been published. There are now a number of articles. Some, I mean, I, yeah, it's really, really the beginning. It is when I presented it. It was somehow a space where many people didn't know about this history. I mean, we know about, of course, the Algerian Revolution, about the, the war. We know about many things, torture, we know, I'm not saying this, uh, but the, this intersection of planning, architecture, and uh, colonialism, fascism, and war, it's a little bit uh, difficult to swallow, I can imagine, but this is really the, our history. Eh? I mean, it's a history that it's not invented, it's all there, and it's, uh, there is really a, a juxtaposition of different voices. It's not only the, the official archive, but that's really one, we have, we cannot do this. Eh? It's it propaganda again, so, so somehow there are lots of questions and answered questions as well, especially in the case of, of the goal. I mean, if you say it's a colonial project of the goal, this is my own point of view. I'm, as an author, of course, he, she or he or whoever can say I completely um, disagree. But this colonial project is also is really specific about the Plan de Constantine, about this uh, uh, five-year socio-economic development plan that was launched during a very violent war with the resources of the south of Algeria, with this oil and gas. So you invest in this own country, you build the pipes, you feed. Europe, okay? At the same time, you also build very poor, as we saw, um, in terms of quality housing units. For who? For Algerians. What happened in 1962, these companies stayed. So it's, it's very, it's for me, it's another way of keeping or of extending colonialism, of keeping all these um, companies in Algeria after the independence. How do, how do we want to call it? I call it colonialism. The French called it cooperation. Then, you know, there are many other, <laughs> there are many other, I, I list all the possible uh, <laughs> interpretation, again, to come back to the term translation and interpretation. There are many, many other uh, um, takes on that. So, I mean, I'm very open also to those who can say, look, this is not, I disagree, and we should discuss it around the round table. I'm open about it. I guess um, that links to something you mentioned in the beginning about education, um, and like you had the article four of like how um, history should be taught and and kind of how the French the role of France should be represented. And I'm just curious as to I think link to your comment like uh, I think colonialism is so layered into how people understand a culture, a country, history, and how do you even start to undo that? Like how do you actually uh, what level do you pitch change? Like, how do you change the way people are educated um, about a certain history? Or, um, 
how do you get like, your book onto the reading list of, of various curriculum? I mean, I, I'm just curious if that's something you've... I mean, I, I don't know how to get, I mean, I don't know about the last sentence. I, I'm not like, you know, systematic, I have to do that. But in, in as an educator, I'm teaching. So this is really a, an issue that I'm dealing with every day. And for me, it's really important, not only in my courses, I think when we talk about decolonizing knowledge, we can't just have, you know, diverse a group of uh, students and diverse, and diverse, you know, in the US, it's we have to also have a round table around it. <laughs> so, 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 so somehow, <laughs> it's really about, about uh, uh, rethinking the curriculum, rethinking our syllabi, rethinking the way that, uh, especially in architecture schools, not only the histories and theories, but also this uh, design studio, so the units here, are thought, what are the references that we use? You know, what, when I talked about this homogenization, it's true. When, when I'm invited to reviews and then I, I, I look at the syllabi, I mean, most of them use the same people. This is like very problematic. How come that we have the same people everywhere, wherever people go? I mean, there are many people and there are many also articles and books translated into English. I mean, at the beginning I thought, okay, maybe it's a language problem. No, at, at, the, at the end, it's a mentality problem. It's a mind that we have to change. So this is, I think, something that we have to do at all levels. And the students, at least in the US, I don't know here, are very um, uh, ready for it. They are asking that, and sometimes the faculty are not ready. So this is, I think, something that we have to work on. But definitely is about uh, the interlocutors and the aim of the studios and the seminars that we are offering. I think this is very important. And something else, I think we do use the term decolonizing very much everywhere in almost now each uh, discipline, you know, decolonizing this, decolonizing. It's very, very important. But uh, let's also ask ourselves how. And how do we do it, but systematically and seriously and not just in the title and then at the end you have the same usual suspects. <laughs> yeah, following what Manny just said, um, this is based on my own experience researching this topic and I chose my family as like primary sources essentially to like interview them about their experience but like basically most of their reaction was every time they told me something they had experienced mm -hmm. or had seen or like felt then they followed it by, but I don't know. You should read the book written by a historian because like I saw this stuff, but I didn't I don't know what this is. And like they were constantly like devaluing their own lived experience and overvaluing someone who is credible yes. in a way. So like I think part of that is also an empowerment process. And actually it took me so long to convince them to like come out a bit more about this. Yeah, I mean it's a very long process. Also, don't push too much. No, no, I don't. I don't. No, no, no. I mean, uh, what I'm, what I want to say, I don't know in your case, but in my case, it was a really very, very long process. Also, of, of discussing, you know, with the people who were um, displaced, but also the people who used this as, a, as, a, as, I mean, French generals, for example. I did interview them. I did do a lot of interviews, but it, you know, it takes really years not uh, weeks you know very yes and and some and most of the time at the very beginning people don't i mean don't trust me of course so who am i you know and and it really takes time to to try to understand or to to build that trust and that relationship with the people and it is true you really need to not read books but to juxtapose as many voices and test as many <laughs> information and knowledges and positions as possible because Sometimes it's not so easy, and for me this is also part of of the stories that we write. In the in the case of Roche Noir, um, I spend I don't know how many uh, uh, like times going back 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 to the archives of this architect, but it was the uh, uh, sorry classified or not really classified. It was I knew where it was, but it was not open to the public because there wasn't really an inventory. So somehow I insisted, insisted, like this cannot be written without the architecture of counter-revolution. I want to show that counter-revolution is not only against the Algerian people, but also against the French people, because the OS for the, the goal were also insurgent, were terrorists, you know. So I really wanted to have that, that part also of this like larger reflection. And uh, they were like, no, we can't, we can't open, you know, so I, I insisted, I mean, Again, like long time and a lot of, you know, uh, 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 you know, 
Yes, and you know the French bureaucratic uh, machine is also very heavy. At the very end, eventually, we managed. And what was very interesting to see is that the architect did not keep most of these documents and, and, and most of these plans because maybe, again, I don't know. I also say it, I don't know why, but let's speculate. Let's also think why. I mean, this was the most, uh, like, the, the fee that he got for this project was so high. I mean, it was so important. This is a huge city, and eh? he was very young. So it was a very important commission. How come that the, the archives are not there? So instead of just getting rid of it, I made it part of the, of, the, of the text, you know. Like, this is a question that I'm asking, really. Where are, so I am right, but I do need to write this chapter, although the archives are not there. So it's really part of the story that you, you tell as well. So it becomes, like, more, yeah, part that, something that you can share with others, although you don't have enough sources. I think that's a, a nice... Oh, we have one, oh. sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I mean, just expanding on that question, I'm curious, to, I mean, I found it very interesting, this idea of taking something, you know, from, from the French and turning it on its head in the exhibition, as you said, but I also want to understand, you know, what, what are the limits of that medium, you know, what's, what's absent from the cinematic footage, for one, but also, uh, is there alternative, I mean, are there documentations from Algeria itself you, you came across, or, or alternative voices, you know, of course. beyond that? Yes, so, like, uh, good, good girl exhibition is, you know, putting everything there and making, you know, like, pacifying, as the French would say, okay? <laughs> that was exactly what I didn't want to do, is to say, okay, um, let's try to understand this psychology of colonialism. I mean, there were like many resistance. Uh, now today, of course, uh, Algeria was independent in 1962. It's not that we have to say that there were like many resistance. I said you know, it's not the, the aim of this really book to talk about the Algerian resistance, but there were, and you know. But in the exhibition, for me, what was really important is to. Uh, show the uh, many levels of French voices, not one, not only the military. Yeah? So we have civilian, we have military voices, but also different institutions. And they were contradicting each other. You know, some, this is really interesting because normally we think of, okay, the, 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 the French Republic and then, you know, but I really wanted to show all these levels of contradictions and also what I said at the very beginning, that it wasn't only a, the, a war between France and Algeria, you know, French Algerians fighting against the French army. No, it was also a war among the French. And this is very important because in France, we do not, we do, for example, eh? May 1958 was this putsch. The Fourth Republic collapsed. Is it part of like the official history of France? I mean, I, I really wrote uh, a couple of pages about the difference between May 58 and May 68. We all know it's May 68. But who knows May 58? And that putsch collapsed the whole Fourth Republic. So it's so important that even the history of France told in a way that we are not so familiar with, for me, was very, very important. So I also tried to find um, sources or, or materials from uh, young officers who were there. These are only private archives who were there filming as well. So this is not really something that you see normally. It's published in the book, but also in the exhibition. So all these uh, propaganda videos were somehow dismantled or were um, deconstructed. So you see that everything that we see here is a theater, is part of this machine of making, producing this audiovisual documents. And, and this is really, I was told, that I wasn't really, you know, like systematically planned this way. I was told that this is fascinating, that you see all these layers and, and, and somehow you are, you really, yeah, you, you are surprised by the complexity of these contradictions. And there was a war, internal war, somehow. Thank you. You're welcome.
Anyway, um, this isn't the end, but um, <laughs> I think it's a nice moment to pause and thank you for such an amazing lecture. No, thank you very but much. But I'm sure, I, I think, as uh, Tong put it, that all of us have lots to, to talk to you about. So With I invite pleasure. you all to come upstairs and join us for a drink and get to chat to Samia Mo. But for now, please join me in thanking her for a great lecture. Thank you. <laughs>